thank you for your invitation. A great blessing always to preach the gospel, especially Pastor Campbell, who's been one of our great good friends, gospel leaders, and I appreciate being here. Tonight, I leave in the morning for uh, Holland, preach in their conference and do a tent crusade, and looking forward to that. God is at work, can you say amen? amen? I've been fascinated in my life with seeds. When I was a boy, uh, we lived next to a farm, and I would take uh, corn seeds, bean seeds, wheat seeds uh, and dig under the ground, plant them and then water them and I was fascinated as I would see the ground break and a plant come up from those seeds. That's one of the miracles of God. They can take a seed together, dissect it, take the material but they can't create it because God put life in it. So think about that for a moment. A seed. I want to preach about seeds tonight. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. The parable of the mustard seed. Now the parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed it in his field which indeed is the least of all seeds but when it is grown is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree and so from that Free, the birds of the air come and lodge it in the branches of it. Many years ago, they uh, dug in the Great Pyramid in Egypt. And as they opened that, they found inside a number of wheat seeds. They'd lain there for 4,000 years. They planted those seeds and they come up exactly like God had ordained a wheat seed to come up. They laid there for 4,000 years. Life was invested in that, those seeds. And when they were planted and watered and germinated, they came up exactly like God intended them. So let's think tonight about the potential of God. This is illustrated by a seed. And God says in the Word that you and I as human beings, every person is a seed. God has created them with a purpose. He has an aim, but they have to be aimed towards the dirt. They have to be germinated. And every person has a destiny. And when time has fulfilled that, and the environment has done its work and it's germinated, they are aimed at a purpose that God has ordained. Now let's say for a moment about our fellowship. I'm not sure if you've read John Gooding's book, Regions Beyond. He wrote that a couple of years ago. And uh, I added a footnote to it. The title of the book is Regions Beyond. It talks about our fellowship, the history and the principles of our fellowship, and discipleship. And I added to that, impacting the world from a small church in a small town. 
and indeed that book tells that story. Last year, this year actually, earlier this year, I was in the Philippine Islands, went there for their conference. I arrived on Wednesday night. As I arrived on Wednesday night, it reminded me of my first trip to the Philippines, which was probably 1974. And we were doing a conference in a little small town called Marikina, which at that time was a suburb of Manila. And that was the first conference that we did there. It was in a little building, and uh, there was not over 35 people in that building. In front of the pulpit, a dog lay asleep. We never did wake him up. <laughs> While I'm preaching, a chicken came walking across the pulpit. just in the Philippines preaching their conference and in that building was not 35 people, 1,200 people. When I landed on Wednesday night, there was a teenage choir singing there, there were about 15, maybe 18 teenagers, and they were Vietnamese. Think about this for a moment now. They were the results of a Filipino pastor that went as a missionary to Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, planted a church, and now he's brought these teenagers back. They're singing in that conference. <laughs> I'm stunned. See, I was alive when the Vietnam War was on. The next morning, when I went, I sat in the back. As I sat down, I sat back of a man sitting in a chair. The pastor that planted that Vietnamese church was preaching in Tagalog, the main language of the Philippines. As he was preaching, there was a man sitting in front of me in a chair. He's interpreting that in English. Richard's preaching in Tagalog. He's interpreting that into English. There's a man on his right as a Cambodian. He's interpreting what he's preaching in English, the same English yet, in Cambodian, to a group of Cambodians that are there listening. On his left hand side is a group of Filipinos. And they're listening to that being interpreted in English. And I'm watching this scene. I'm stunned as I'm watching that because I've got a good, good bit of history behind me. 1,200 people in that building. They told me that the Philippines has 439 churches that are oriented out of that central church in Manila. During that conference, they planted 10 more churches from that conference, which makes 449 Filipino churches oriented out of that place. Now think about that for a moment. Because here is a miracle of God before our eyes. Philippine missionary, Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City. During that conference, he turned over that church to a Vietnamese pastor that he had discipled and trained. Think about that for a moment. Now here is the overview of the parable of the seed and the mustard seed. The mustard seed, Jesus used that deliberately. He explained that's the smallest seed 
that he could find to describe that. And all of this has come out now of human beings who have yielded to God, given their life, and God is multiplying that seed. In the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 36 through 38, then Jesus sent the multitude away. And he went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, explain unto us the parable of the terrors of the field. He answered and said unto them, he that sowed the seed, the good seed, is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the terrors are the children of the wicked one. And he begins to plant in their minds the power of multiplication. And let's pay attention now. When I was in Australia in 2009, went over to rescue that movement, a man gave me a four-page article. You can get this article on, uh, on your Google. Don't do it while I'm preaching. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we live in a generation, the problem with this generation is you quote a scripture, they look real fast, see if that's what they do. You make a statement of some kind, use a word, they Google it to find out if you're right. They're checking you out while you're preaching. <laughs> so the name of this article is The Three Degrees of Contention. I was fascinated as I read that article. Because that article says that when a group of people come together and associate, they convey a dimension and they take on some characteristics of all the people that are there. Now there's some uh, weight challenge people in this building tonight. I'm being very kind. To be honest with you, fat. This article says that when you're associated with people, there's something that takes place, a social dynamic that's automatic. It's not because people are out there saying, you need to eat something, eat something. I came in the, in the break, break time today and I looked and there's all these donuts and I walked by and said, fat, 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 fat. <laughs> Because people are trying to make you fat, but there's an automatic social dimension that you automatically will begin to take on. And the article ended in the last words of the article says that you become like the people that you associate with. Now that has good dimensions and bad dimensions. It also noted that if you associate in a crowd of people, and there are people who smoke, you are automatically inspired to smoke. I was fascinated as I read this article, three degrees of contagion. Now this is an automatic dimension, and it is a social dynamic. Not because these people are trying to convert you, make you fat, or smoke, it's automatic. So the good part of that is, if you're here tonight uh, and you're not saved, uh, you're being influenced for God. Amen. Thank God for that. Amen. So ponder this for a moment as we consider this. Uh, I have a picture here, you probably can't make it out, but it's a picture of a dandelion. It is in full bloom. There's 2,000 seeds in this picture. And when you plant a lawn, those dandelions are going to come up. You don't want them there. You're not cultivating them. But God has put a potential 
in nature. And that potential is also human beings. And automatically, it will take place. Many people who are motivated by association that they're associating with other people. I worked many years ago. I was in the United States Air Force, three years, nine months, and 27 days. <laughs> they trained me to be a flight line electrician, and I was working at Duke Air Force Base in Phoenix. And I got a job as a civilian employee. He worked, gave me a wonderful opportunity to witness it, because my job took me all around to different workers. And I was busy evangelizing while I was there, while doing my job. And uh, I had a co-worker, I began to witness him. He had a Lutheran background. He began to be very profoundly convicted. He was right at the point of making a decision for Jesus uh, when he began to date a young girl. Now, I'm not accusing him of doing anything, but I saw a change immediately in this man. I have my suspicions about what was going on, but that's my suspicions. <laughs> we become like the people that we associate with. It's automatic. I was pastoring in Edmund, Idaho many years ago. A woman moved into a house. Her husband was in the military. She was staying there because the rent was cheap. And the Mormons began to work on her. If you're a Mormon, well, don't get mad at me. I'm just talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> she was in financial difficulties. And one of their proselyting methods is financial. They were able to win her over with financial invitations, very strong attraction, and this is why people start hospitals that are religious, this is why people do soup kitchens, this is why the church is involved in those things. William Booth was in England, as he was in England, in England that period of time, children could buy whiskey, hard liquor. The streets were filled with drunkenness. Many children were alcoholic and could go into a pub or a bar and could buy hard liquor. And there was debauchery in the streets. William Booth went for a walk. His wife went to another meeting. When she came home, he said, Dear, I found our call. William Booth and his wife started the Salvation Army. And the Salvation Army made a major impact in the world. When William Booth died, London shut down and they paraded in honor of the tremendous influence that William Booth had exerted on England by the Salvation Army. Now think about what I'm saying here for a moment. I remember a church in Phoenix. This man started a church, and I think when they began to examine how many ministries he was involved in, he had 275 ministries uh, fixing single women's Junk cars, various kinds of ministries, 275. Think about this for a moment. Now, John's Gospel, chapter 12, 21. Yes, has he not rooted himself, but endure for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately. He is offended. Many people begin to be Christians, but they don't continue. Can you say amen? amen. 
I know I'm in an evangelizing fellowship. This church is an evangelizing church, as is our church in Prescott, and many of your churches. But money, morals, and associations uh, cause a change in human perceptions uh, and convictions. Now let's go back to multiplication for a moment. Uh, because someone has written wisely that you can count the number of seeds. Any idiot can count the number of seeds in an apple. But only God knows uh, the apples uh, that are in a seed. Go back now to my statement that God says you're a seed. Every single one of you are a seed. You have a life potential in you. And that life potential that is in you has the ability to multiply itself just like this dandelion bloom. 2,000 seeds that will go out in somebody's lawn, not cultivated, they automatically will take place because God put in his creation the miracle that reproduces in seed. Think about this for a moment. Here, in each seed, 2,000 of those, is the perfect creation of God that will reproduce itself. Now, in like manner, God has put in you a purpose. That purpose is the seed potential, and it will self-propagate unless it's eradicated. Think about that for a moment. There's a potential that is great, a mustard seed, the smallest seed in God's creation has the ability that if it is planted will reproduce and becomes the greatest of trees. Jesus said even the birds of the air are able to lodge in it at night. Now the potential is very great. Matthew chapter 13, let me read it again, verse 31 and 32. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is sown, it is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches of it. Now let's bring this down where the rubber meets the road for a moment. Multiplication. Someone told a story about a man who had a red paper clip. He began to trade that red paper and as he did that, he began to pick up other articles. As he picked up other articles, after 14 trades, one year, he traded again for a house. There's still stupid people in the world. <laughs> Think about that for a moment, because we're just talking about natural human dynamics as life goes on. Think about a small church. I don't know how large your church is. It's in a large town. Thank God for that. It's in a small town. Don't give up hope. Because I deliberately gave the title to that book that John really wrote. To. Impacting the world from a small church in a small town. That's after a couple of splits that took out dozens of churches by rebels. But as I stand before you, I came to Prescott, Arizona with my wife. I mentioned this in the uh, January conference. 
As I came there, I was discouraged. I simply wanted a pastor, and the church was open to me, and I accepted that. Didn't dream that destiny had been triggered in that. In that first church in a building that should have already been condemned, skunks had made their nest underneath that. And when it rained, the odor began to come up through the floor. When we did revivals with Larry Reed, he'd get us all dancing, and when he got us all dancing, he'd feel the building sway. <laughs> That building seated 72 people on opera seats. And that building now, there was 29 people, including seven people in my family, in that first service. And that work of God has grown. And I say work of God because it is a work of God. It has grown to 2,600 churches in 125 countries around the world. No superstars, no millionaires, just common people who believe that they can do work for God. It's become an astonishing size. Many of you are privileged to be in our summer conference. I told Pastor Campbell as I'm sitting on the platform that our concluding service on Friday night had 3,525 people. Legally, we can see 3,100. <laughs> That's what God can do from his seat. Jesus used this, and I'm challenging you tonight. Your life is a seed. From time to time we have people that they go screwy. I think I mentioned this morning that you can leave the fellowship, but the fellowship will never leave you. The reason for that, there's a supernatural dimension that's at work in our fellowship. It's not a work of man, it's a work of God. Just as the seed is in every seed that God created, seed principle is in every human being sitting here tonight. And if that seed is planted in God's purpose, it has the potential to outgrow anything that you can imagine. Yes. And I challenge you tonight, from that little building on Lincoln Street, People come from Prescott the first time, we take them over to Lincoln Street. I think it's turned now into a uh, house for women that their husband are beating them and they want to get out of there and they go over there. But it's still there today. 72 people seated. What God has done because the seeds which were human beings were planted. They were planted as these people began to witness. When I preached the conference recently, I made, I made reference to some of the principles were outside the four walls, our people were led and taught their testimony to Jesus Christ because that's the real seed that would bring forth fruit. God has given in this building tonight, if there's 1,200 here, I think there were 1,200 last night. Think now what God can do in planet Earth. With 1,200 seeds that will plant their lives around the world with the testimony of Jesus Christ. I don't know how many churches are represented here tonight, but think about the potential. I'm talking of history one seed in Prescott, Arizona. But think of the history that can be created if you will go from this building tonight and begin to bear testimony to Jesus Christ 
let your life uh, germinate uh, and remember the statement I made at the conclusion of that article uh, was you become like the people that you hang around with. I want every head bowed, I want every eye closed tonight. Think of my words tonight, the potential that is here. And aren't buildings large enough to contain what God can do? Every person that's here will go from this building and obey God. Plant their life. Let it be germinated. And I'll tell you, the miracle will take place if you will testify. God will bring forth fruit. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. I wonder how many people are in this building tonight. You're not saved. Jesus Christ died on the Calvary's cross for you. Shed his blood. And the Bible says if you will believe that and come to Christ and give your life to him, turn from sin, he will take your life and begin to multiply it. And there isn't our buildings built big enough to hold what God is able to do. I wonder how many people tonight, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, you're not right with God. I would ask you to join the church, sign the creed. I'm asking you to repent from your sins uh, and make Jesus Christ your Savior tonight. I'm not asking you to join the church, join a religion. I'm asking you to tonight surrender to Jesus Christ. Uh, Make him your Savior. Lift your hand right where you're sitting. Hold it where I can see it. Say, I want to do that tonight. Lift it up. Let me see it.